What is up? Wild Runs here, and I have some of the best disc golf I have ever seen, and I cannot wait to share it with you guys. There were so many people that had a chance of the win, and honestly, the top three finishers, if it was a couple years back or even last year, I think every single person that was on the podium would likely have won this event, given if it was last year, because that parody is just getting so darn real. Let's talk about it. And you guys may be wondering, or not, maybe you guys just don't really care about me, uh, I'm actually in the middle of Tokyo, finishing up a, an entire month-long trip in Asia. It has been amazing. I definitely have to say that it has been tough to not upload nearly as much as I want to. I've had so many video ideas come to mind, and I've been desperately wanting to crank them out, but I'm kind of just experiencing life before life happens, AKA kids, even if it does come at the cost of uploading a little bit less, um, but that is just for a brief stint of time uh, because I still have some Simon content that I really wanna upload. Um, but what's more than that is I have a very, very exciting announcement, um, actually a couple, and I'm, I don't really know how much I want to leak, but I will definitely say uh, at the bare minimum that you will see a lot more of me on tour. So <laughs> definitely look forward to that. Um, I'm still kind of in shock of uh, where this whole channel has uh, come in such a little amount of time, like really not that much. So with that, let's just talk about Waco. All right, so for FPO, um, there really isn't that much to say. Obviously, there is just total annihilation from Kristen Tatar. And besides a 7-under, which was a 1031 rated round, she really had not that many phenomenal rounds. I know that it is insane to say that she won with a pretty decent margin without that many good rounds, but I think that is truly where her game is at. Nobody can truly touch Kristen, at least when she is playing consistently well. And with that said, she definitely had some amazing drives, amazing putts. But like so many events in the past, we are not seeing the best of the best of Kristen, and it still is good enough to dominate the FPO division. But with that said, there was definitely some people that had a good run of it until things got a little bit hazy, first one being Ella Hansen. Now we definitely have to mention that last year, obviously um, some dark things happened for Ella, kind of gave it away in the final round, and while that isn't exactly what happened this year, it is not too far off, and it looked like things were going great for her until round three, which may or may not coincidentally have happened at the same course, Brazos Park East. And I definitely think there's probably some mental factors that come into play with this, but her C1 putting was four out of nine, and she made zero circle two putts, so she finished that round with plus four, and Kristen, being the dominant fashion that she is, especially when it comes to crunch time moments, finished with a seven under on that round, making it an 11 stroke swing. And we definitely know Ella is truly capable of getting a win, but at least for the time being, she really, really needs to focus on those final round moments, even though this wasn't final round, but it was close to it, uh, because she has what it takes. It just does not seem to come together in the way that she hopes and is really starting to feel like a trend, not an anomaly. But if you uh, cut out Kristen, the best looking player, at least from some phenomenal drives and some phenomenal putts, was Holland Hanley. With four C2 putts, a great circle one percentage, with her final round getting four circle two putts, with her longest being a 56 footer on hole three, she really was looking so, so good. And even though she got a little bit cold on the back half, she was still looking very, very good. And even though she finished nine strokes back, I do think this builds some amount of confidence for Holland. And I really look forward to seeing her continue to shred and get those near ace runs because it is truly phenomenal and I'm excited to watch it every time it happens. But enough about FPO because it was an annihilation. Uh, let's talk about MPO. There's so many things to talk about, uh, but I want to say some honorable mentions, some missed cuts, and your favorite disc golf YouTuber, at least for the person playing disc golf, that would be Anthony Bedanza. Being his first appearance at an Elite Series, I think there was probably a lot of nerves at play, but with that said, he was playing pretty darn good, at least for what I kind of expect of him in this brand new setting. He did finish 97th at even. Now, even though I have no footage of this, I have to believe that he had some incredible birdies because his round three was three under with a thousand and five rated. And honestly, I think a lot of these holes, while they may seem very gettable to the pros, if you are not accustomed to the stress that comes with being on tour, I think it really is a tough battle and you get so much better at it the more you do it. So I think while he did have some struggles and did get a triple bogey in round one, I think all of that is just kind of growing pains because he will get better as time goes on. But next up, let's talk about the people that we expected to make the cut that did not. Uh, first one being Drew, finished 83rd. Um, I think that's probably not crazy because I don't think Drew really does too well at Waco. Um, but with that said, still kind of surprising. Uh, next up, Paul, Paul McBeth. 
uh, ends in 64th place, missing cut. And then another world champion, Isaac Robinson, also did not make the cut. Now, he was only one stroke away from making the cut, so I think while this is pretty sad, it's honestly probably not that crazy. It's just unlucky, things happen. That's the way Waco goes. But the biggest thing that I did not see coming was Simon finishing in 76th place, nowhere near the cut line. <clears throat> he actually published a video today mentioning that his round didn't really feel terrible. It just, he didn't really get things going the way that he had hoped. But it is definitely crazy to think this might have been his worst event of all time. That is just a shocking statement, and it truly shows the level of parody that we have in disc golf. I don't want to rejoice over Simon's failures, but it is certainly cool to say that we are in a time where Simon Lazat is not good enough to make the cut line. I'm sure this will not happen consistently, but it is still so, so crazy that we have all these players that are fighting for the win even when it comes to like 30th place. You can be 30th place in round two and still have a fight for the win. And then just quickly some honorable mentions, Dickerson was incredibly sharp, at least his final round, where he had nine birdies through his first 11 holes of his final round. AB totally shreds, finishing 11 under in his final round with the ace, love it. Kyle Klein was looking incredibly good, I thought he might have a run, but ultimately was just a little bit shaky and missed 15 circle two putts, hitting only one circle two putt per round, which is just not enough to fight for the win. Next up, Mason Ford was incredibly smooth as always. It was really looking like he might have a go of it, but as the final round progressed, he just had a couple of slip ups that put him out of contention. And then the last awful mention has to be your boy, Papa Nate. I was not thinking he was going to have a true run of it because I was like, yeah, first round, he's doing good. That's, I want him to do good, but that's just probably not going to end up all that well because he's really struggling with consistency as he is taking a step back in disc golf. But it seems like, wow, he's still just incredibly sharp. If he really does want it, he seems like he can have a good run of fighting for the win still, which is awesome. And he mentioned this before the final round, which is very telling. If I can get this off my chest. When I uh, lost my cash streak last year, it messed with me and I thought, oh, now I'll, now I'll play aggressive and, this, and I don't have the pressure on me anymore. And I like forgot who I was kind of, and I missed cash a bunch more times and I can't even remember how it happened. Like, and now I'm just being me again. Cause it was, I thought it would be fun to play aggressive and it wasn't not for me. Cause that's not the way I, that's not my, that's not who I am. So now I'm back to throwing the shots I want to throw. And uh, obviously that's paying dividends cause I'm playing way better than I played pretty much all of last year. But lastly, let's talk about the true contenders. It was a neck and neck race for the win between these top three players, Nicholas, Luke Humphreys, and the inevitable Gannon Burr. Now I have so many thoughts about these podium finishers. I have to say, I was really hoping that we could get a chase card champion with Nicholas. I was thinking it would be so cool for him to win from chase card and get a sort of major, even though it's not a major, and it would have been his first Elite Series win. And if you look at his putts throughout this entire tournament, it feels like his putts from Champions Cup. Just absolutely insane. It is astounding how consistent he is from the putting green, and his drives were just so freaking perfect. And I honestly thought this is kind of just like a lock. At least at hole 16, it was looking like there's no one else that can even touch him. Assuming nothing crazy happens, he has what it takes to take it down. But then hole 17, he has a very unlucky drive. He definitely seemed a little bit tentative and was not wanting to go crazy OB on the right. So he went a little OB on the left, which ended up being a bogey. And that really opened the door for Luke and Gannon. And although Nicholas finished 32 out of 33 from C1, that was not enough to cement the win. So it was a battle between Luke and Gannon. Now they were on the lead card, so the majority of this round was focused on them and not Nicholas, even though Nicholas was doing pretty darn good. And besides a bogey to start for Luke, it was truly a neck and neck race. And what was even crazier is that Gannon wasn't playing his best. He had a couple of chain outs. He had a weird instance where he had like a time violation almost called. He had like a warning and it felt like it was going to happen again. So he was kind of rushing and it was looking like a very bad mental space for Gannon, but he is just truly the GOAT, at least for the time being. No one else seems to have the consistency that he does. So even though that Luke is a phenomenally good player, extremely smooth, just like Mason, he has so much consistency. Every time he puts, it looks like it is just guaranteed to go in the basket. Even with all that said, there was one moment where it all came crumbling down and I kind of saw it coming before the hole even started. And that was the final hole, 
hole 18. Now I was doing the mental math. I was like, I know Luke has a distance, but with the uphill, I just don't know if that's actually going to be a reality, especially with all the nerves coming into play at this very moment. Now that is very telling because his drive at least was way shanked. It got lucky. It went into great position, but the second shot was a disaster, going right into the OB, which I think he probably didn't even really know about all that much. It honestly looked fine out of his hands, got stopped right into the OB, giving Gannon a perfect chance to get an upshot and get the win. Now Luke gave it a heroic run, but that ultimately was just a little bit too short, and Gannon throws one of the best upshots I have ever seen, especially when you absolutely need to hit it and it ends up being about 25 short and then jams it, making him the Waco champion. Now I will say there's so many cool things about this round. I truly think if you watch it back on Jomez or live, you will not regret it. This is some of the best disc golf I've ever seen. And even though I have to admit that I think Luke, if you were to battle Gannon, maybe like a hundred times, I think he only wins maybe 10% of the time, but that is still just so exciting to watch uh, because we don't get to see Luke all that often in the league card, and he is a really, really good player. So it was just so freaking cool to see him truly crush in the most unique throwing style. He has so much power that you don't even notice because it's just like a smooth looking shot, and then he'll throw it like 500 feet. It is it is just amazing. But I think this definitely puts Gannon in that kind of echelon, being a true dominant player, kind of like Calvin was last year. I think this is definitely a time where Gannon can win every single event he goes to. That is not true for basically any other player uh, besides maybe AB. Um, but this is truly Gannon Burr's time to shine. It seems like nerves are just not affecting him in any manner. Even though he has a time violation, even though he has so many weird spit outs, none of that seems to matter because his distance, his insane control, his insane putting are really all coming together and it seems like nobody else can touch him given a neck and neck battle for the win. So with that said, what do you guys think about all this madness? Were you as excited as I was for the potential three-way playoff that we would have gotten if Ganon Burr were to miss that putt? Man, that would have been so cool. Or you not bought into the hype, not bought into the new course? I'd love to know. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> Be sure to subscribe. I can't wait to make more videos when I get back home. But with that said, Wild Runs, signing out. Be sure to subscribe. Really, really do subscribe. You have a lot of good stuff coming, um, and I will not spam you. So be sure to subscribe. Wild Rounds, signing out. Peace.